Yeah, so welcome back. I want to continue with um, our discussion of so-called pre-Socratic philosophy. Uh, and I want to pick up uh, a little bit on where we left off with Pythagoras and the harmonies, and then uh, move a little bit in, back into Heraclitus. And then I want to read the second chorus of Sophocles' play, Antigone, um, uh, to try to carry forward a little bit farther the... Um, this little, little sort of philosophical thing we've been developing, this orientation towards metaphysics, towards the question, or towards the recognition of the ultimate nature of reality and the, and the investigation of it. So with, with Pythagoras, uh, remember we had this idea of these harmonies, the fifth, the fourth, and the octave. Um, and so the point, one... Well, I guess there were a couple of points there. Um, so one point is that um, some of these notes stand in, you might kind of, you might say a natural relationship to each other. I want to use that word natural and you'll see why in a minute. They stand in a natural relationship to each other. Uh, and uh, it, and um, and when they are put in relationship, they, they reveal to you um, something more than you would ever recognize by just looking at them by themselves. Like just this note by, or this note by itself, it's just a note. This note by itself is just a note, whatever. But you play them together and you get a slightly out of tune uh, fifth interval. Um, th the point I want to make isn't quite as clear when I just use two notes together like that, an, an interval. But let me let me add a third note. and, uh, and uh, so I'll be making what we normally call a chord, which is just based on the same idea, right? I'm going to take one note and and play it together with another note with which it is concordant, with which it is sort of inherently in tune. And I'm going to add another one, but but uh, uh, so let's look. Let's let's to pick these three notes here. Like I could play this note. It's a note like any other note. Play this note. It's a note. So three notes. But I can play them together. And that's sort of interesting. Uh, you'll you'll hear the point more in a moment. I I think here are three other notes. Just a note. Just a note. Just a note. But I can play them together. Whoops. Now let me let me play those two back to back. Those two chords back to back where I'm going to play those notes together instead of playing them separately. I think you can hear both that it sounds like music. Um, you can also hear that each of those conglomerations of notes sounds like a kind of a unit and they each they each have their own distinctive character and the, the one actually kind of leads your ear to the other one. And that'll be even clearer if I had a third one. Right, so let's do a... You can hear how that last one kind of brings to completion what was started here. You know, you're you're in hearing those things. You hear the first one, and it's it sets up a certain sort of feeling, a certain kind of tension. You hear the next one, and that next one seems to have picked up on that tension and taken it somewhere, to the right place actually. And then you play the third one, and it brings that whole thing to a close. Uh, those that description, I think, is uh, um, is very well attested. That's what people all over the world have heard many many times it's what you're hearing every time you hear a pop song so that that it is a fact that we hear those things is is overwhelmingly attested in people's experience uh, that basically that certain specifiable ways of playing notes together uh, set up kind of expectations and um, there the the expectation you know, I was saying before that you hear those different things and they feel different, those different intervals. Well, with these chords, that's even stronger. You can see that the, that they set up 
certain feelings of tension and resolution such that uh, such that you know from the thing that sounds tense to the thing that sounds like a revolu- resolution there's a kind of a natural trajectory trajectory and you feel like the later thing that's being played s- addresses and satisfies the thing that was set up by that first one um, uh, so all, what I want you to notice there is that I'm just playing notes. Like each one is just a sound. Just a bunch of little sounds. Like e- Actually, even there, because I played them chronologically so close together, you can't help hearing them in connection. So you heard a little bit of a kind of a melody there. So you, you probably were still hearing them in relationship to each other. I was trying to get you to hear them separately, but I would have had to put a lot more time in between them, I guess, to really make that work. But the point is, when you really do hear them separately, each is just a sound and it's kind of indifferent with respect to each other. But when you put them together in those harmonies, those concordant relationships to make what we call chords, then they start to take on these affective things like you feel them and and they're related even to desire like you want this to be resolved your attention is set up and you want to hear the sound that's going to settle it um so i said there were a few points well the, the first one was was basically that that um the 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 harmony is not reducible to just a sum of the parts right if you if you take the individual experience of hearing each note completely separately and put them together, you'd have a series of independent, uninteresting so sonic experiences. But when you actually play them together, their, their, their being together produces something, or, or produces might even be the wrong word, results in something, lets it be the case that something bigger is, is, is manifest. Um, music, basically. Music is this amazing reality where people feel like dancing and they feel like singing and they get excited or they get sad. Like it's this thing that fiddles around with your emotions. It's just sounds, it's just pitches. But there's this amazing way that when certain pitches come together, they produce certain effects in you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, So the second point then that I was making was that the whole, the, the harmony is greater than the sum of its individual parts. Um, the third point is, that's amazing. Um, the third point is that those harmonies, that um, those natural harmonies, naturally occurring greater realities that come about through the coming together of the individual pieces, notes in this case, um, brings about realities that we encounter and we feel them, you know, in our spirit. Um, they, they bring about real effects, real experiences, and that's just the amazing form the world takes. You, you don't really know why that happens. Uh, you, you, know, you can learn that if you put this note together with this note together with this note, you'll get a minor seventh chord. You put this one together with this one, this one, you'll get a dominant seventh you put this one together with this one, you get a major seventh, all without roots. Um, but you put those together and you get those chords. Um, you can learn that that's true, but you learn it by being exposed to that reality and figuring out. You kind of have to work backwards from hearing sounds that affect you to saying, oh, I guess that's how it works, right? In other words, this is part of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts point. You, you can't, there's, not, there's no way that you can investigate this note by itself and just discern its sort of physical properties and denote, pick, pick another note and say, oh, if you added this to this, you'd get this concordant sound that's going to move people in this way. Right? It's not, that's, that's a bizarre discovery. It's an epiphany that you have of reality. It's a bizarre discovery that we make by existing in the world where the world shows us its, its kind of wonderful, surprising form. And when we've discovered that, we can then try to figure out how to make it happen. We, we do that, and people learn how to play music and so on. Um, but, but what we're encountering is, is the form in which reality 
gives itself over to us. And in this case, the, 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 the thing that's striking and amazing about reality is that those sort of wonderful realities are harmonies. At the moment, I want to use that in the strictly musical sense. But I want to move on now to think about that notion of harmony, the notion of wonder in a somewhat richer way. Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's go to the second chorus of Sophocles' Antigone. So I, I like it in this translation. Uh, this is, a, this is an, a book that until very recently was readily available. It's Greek Tragedies, Volume 1, uh, edited by David Green, and it's the translation of Sophocles' play Antigone by Richmond Lattimore, which I think is a great translation. Unfortunately, it's hard to buy this book now because they've the uh, University of Chicago Press put out a revised edition, and uh, Mark Griffith and Glenn Most revised the translations, and uh, most of the things that I like in Lattimore's translation are gone. Um, so it's unfortunate. I'm going to read what I think is one of the greatest pieces of translation ever, um, but you you have to hunt for it now. Um, but anyway, this is the translation of the second uh, choral ode from Sophocles' play Antigone. Uh, off the top of my head, I guess this is from about, let me see if it says here quickly, I didn't think to check that up, 442 BC. Let's just read it. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a play, the play is itself very interesting, I'm going to go on and talk about it a little bit, but I just want to ex extract this one little part where the chorus, a group, group of people are, are singing this little poem, this little song, speech, as they dance across the stage. Um, uh, and so... Um, they say, many are the wonders, but none is more wonderful than what is man. Paula Tadena, many are the wonders. Um, so you know, think, what, are they, what does wonders mean? What does he mean when you say there are wonders? Tadena is the Greek. Um, well, you mean things that um, inspire in you an attitude of awe or surprise or wonder, right? Things that are wonderful, things that are amazing, and they can be because they're overwhelming it can be because they're beautiful could be for all kinds of reasons but they're things that um, uh, are amazing and sh should inspire in you that that sense you might say they're awesome right you approach them with awe so he says many are the wonders but none is more wonderful than what is man so ma man is the most wonderful of the wonders the Greek word tadena, tadenos, means wonderful, or t the plural tadena, the wonderful things, um, brings with it also a, the kind of negative sense. Like it can also mean terrifying, and so that and that also fits with our with our English word wonder. Although we tend to use our English word wonder in a more exclusively positive sense. Like when you say awesome, you mean positive things. Whereas we could also say awful, and then we might have a more negative sense. Um, so, uh, or terrible instead of wonderful inspires terror or something like that and you you want to have some of that sense here too these are wonders but they're but the, the greek word denos uh means um awe-inspiring in that way that um i mean it could be positive or it could be negative anyway so many are the wonders none is more wonder but none is more wonderful than what is man this man this it is that crosses the sea so they're going to talk about why the human being is so wonderful. Uh, the man doesn't mean masculine. It means uh, anthropos, a human being. Um, uh, this is that crosses the sea with the south wind storming and the waves swelling, breaking around him in roaring surf. Right, so why, is, why are we wonderful? Well, because th this amazing thing we can do. We can cross the sea when the wind is storming and the waves are swelling and breaking around you because we make boats and so on. So the thing that's amazing about us is that we can get across the sea. And what that tells you is, oh, right, the sea is a wonder. Right? The sea is, is one of those wonders. Like It's amazing that there is such a thing as sea. And it's terrifying if you think of its intensity. Um, and the wind, the south wind storming and the waves crashing. You know, if, if, if you think of the sea and the wind, those are wonders. Those, are, those warrant our amazement. Um, they're overwhelmingly powerful and like I, uh, years ago I used to live in um, Nova Scotia uh, for a couple of years 
And I remember living there the first winter. I felt like I had never seen the elements like that before. Just the wind, the snow, the rain, the cold. Um, I, it was it was just like, um, I'd, even though I had a little house, I lived in a little town and so on, it really felt like I'd been taken out of civilization and I'd really been shown what nature was like. It, it was just so strong and overwhelming. Um, uh, and you know, on the east coast of Canada, and I've lived in Newfoundland for a while too. That's somewhat similar. And, and yeah, let's let's stick with the. I was going to say something else, but let's stick with the wind and the rain for a minute. So I want you to think about why you might say the wind and the rain are wonders. Um, they're terrible. On the other hand, though, the sea is pretty great. Uh, it plays a huge role in our lives. We get if it, it it is a living habitat for creatures that we're going to go on to see in a minute. Um, and uh, the wind, like, it, you know, it, we live in relationship to the sea and the air, and they're terrible, but we also really are happy about having a world that has them in it. So they're both sort of positive and negative, too. And so we're, you know, he says we're, in a way, more amazing, more wonderful, more terrible, perhaps, than those, because we can actually cross them, even though they're so powerful. We actually have figured out how to cross them in a raft or whatever, a boat. But, think, but thinking about that lets you think about them as wonders. So it says, many are the wonders, none is more wonderful than man. And the first one it draws your attention to is us crossing the sea and thereby draws your attention to the wonder of the sea. And the first point I want to make there is maybe you didn't notice that before. I mean, maybe you did. Or maybe you just took it for granted. There's wind, there's rain, there's sea. But like that's, that's part of the form in which reality occurs. But we, we, we often don't have an attitude of wonder towards it. We often just, yeah, take it for granted. Uh, uh, and indeed, that we are able to cross it in a boat should be pretty wonderful too because we had to deal with that awesomeness of the sea and the wind and figure out how to do it. But you can actually just go to your summer cottage and get in a motorboat and turn it on and zip across the water and never notice either the awe-inspiring danger of the sea and the wind or even what went into making it be the case that you could have a boat you know i talked before about trying to get behind 2500 years of accomplishment in order to go back and read the greeks well, this maybe is an example of that of a powerful way that reading the greeks can um maybe attune you to things you're not noticing in your experience because you're so used to what has happened in 25 years with, with the result that you can't even see what those 25 years of, of activity were about because you just live with the comfort of these familiar things now. So here we're starting that. Like, go back. Notice the sea. Notice the wind. Notice that you don't know what those things are at all. They're just given facts of the way reality occurs. And boy, you depend on them and boy, are they terrifying. Right? And so then the amazing thing about human beings is that we actually figured out how to cross that. Many are the wonders, none is more wonderful than what is man. This it is that crosses the sea with the south wind storming and the waves swelling, breaking around him in roaring surf. He it is again who wears away the earth, the oldest of gods, immortal and unwearied, as the plows wind across her from year to year when he works her with the breed that comes from horses. Um, so earth, oldest of gods. Like, why would you call earth? earth a god well maybe for that same reason i was just giving you as 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 um he says the earth immortal unwearied as the plows wind across her from year to year right the earth gives you the harvest the earth is this amazing domain of fertility where the heck did that come from who knows that's just again the given form of your reality it, it gives you a place to live it, it it is the context in which all those things that you depend on emerge and it's amazing it's just there year after year as he says immortal unwearied uh producing and so but then what we were pretty amazing again because we wear away at it with plows we go across it with the plows and we've learned how to get from the earth the crops we want and we do that with horses another amazing thing animals 
that occur and live on the ant. And then the next thing, the tribe of, I'm going to come back to that, but let's keep reading. The tribe of the lighthearted birds he snares. He takes prisoner the races of savage beasts and the brood of fish of the sea and the close spun, uh, with the close spun web of nests. Well, so, yeah, we, ha we have the sea and the earth and the winds in the air as, in a way, the first layer of the wonderful dimensions of, of reality as it occurs. And the, the, that's just the form in which it occurs. And, and so each of those is, a, is an amazing thing we encounter, which we might not know, the amazingness of which we might not notice enough. Um, but each of these things, you know, in addition to being water that we drink and air that we're going to breathe and, and uh, earth that we're going to go plants and so on, also is the domain of the plants and the animals and the fish and the birds, right? They, those, those domains also provide habitat for different kinds of animals and plants. And plant, so plants and animals, again, are wonders in and of themselves. And part of the wonder of those elements, the earth, the water, the air, and I guess we should remember the sun, too, that's pro, uh, dealing with all of this, um, is that they provide the context in which plants and animals can be. So yeah, many are the wonders. What are they? Uh, ocean and water, wind and air, sun and light and heat, earth, and you know both both a solid base that you can build a home on and a fertile environment in which things grow. Right? Those the that's those are those are maybe your first four wonders, and then the birds that fly in the air, the fish that live in the sea, the horses and the other savage beasts that live on the land, and of course the plants that grow, that we breed and that we get harvest, plant, plant grow and harvest with our plows and so on. Um, so the first thing that I want to bring out of this choral ode is just that description of the wonders and, and to take that back to what we've been saying, right? I was talking about music as a wonder. Well, earth is a wonder. Air is a wonder. Wind, seasons, day and night. The, these things are the amazing context, given context, within which our whole world unfolds. Uh, and we, we take them for granted. Uh, so, um, well, and let me put a name on that. What's that thing we take for granted? Let's call it nature. The Greek, the Greek word, nature is, a, is a bit derived from the Latin word, and it's translation of the Greek word, the Greek word is phusis, which is where we get the word physical. So if somebody says something is physical, they really, it just means it's natural, same, same meaning. But anyway, phusis is the Greek word for nature. And um, what, are they, why, what, are they, what do they say when they call nature phusis? Well, in, in, uh, it has as its root this word fool, which is to grow. And the thing, the thing about nature is it's this world of things that grow, things that sort of on their own become something. So maybe even more than grow, you could say in a basic way, it's kind of what, what emerges of itself. And that's what the, that's basically what we're saying when we talk about nature. This, this is the self occurring form of the real. It's just, it's just the given way reality happens. And it's amazing. Um, we can spend lots of time trying to study it and there's plenty to learn about it. But the important point first is the recognition of it. it. It's just the wonderful fact of the form reality happens to take. It happens to be the case that there is this thing that is reality, and reality happens to work in such a way that it takes this form. And this is the way reality occurs of itself. And that sense of the self-occurring form, that's what, that's what we say when we say nature or when we say fusus. So the point of this second chorus of Antigone, at first, or at least the point I want to bring out of it, is to draw your attention to Fusus, the nature as the self-occurring form of the real, and to bring out the point that the Sophocles makes that really the, the attitude that calls for is wonder. Those things are wonders. And that, so it's, it's in the sense that it call, they're, they're tadena. It's something that calls for us to recognize uh, their overwhelming and kind of mysterious and essential character. Um, okay, just a little bit more from this. But so then he says, 
uh, a cunning fellow is man, is the, is the human being. Uh, his contrivances, machines, the things he makes, make him master of the beasts of the field and those that move in the mountains. He, he brings the horse with the shaggy neck to bend under the yoke and the untamed mountain bull. Uh, I'll, st I'll stop there. I just want to look, I'm going to read on a bit, but I want to pause there. Um, so I want to just go back and remind you of a few things. So he said, you know, the tribe of lighthearted birds, he snares he, and he takes prisoners, beasts and the broods of the fish of the sea with the close spun web of nets. So using that word close spun draws your attention to something. We use nets to catch these things. Where did that come from? Spiders do it. Right? The, the, the thing that we amazingly have made to use that allows us to be this most wonderful thing that can actually get the better of nature, so to speak, comes from nature. We, we, we learn by looking at what a spider does naturally that we could do this thing. So the spider's web is itself another wonder. And our amazing tool that lets us be the master of the of the beasts that we and the fish that we net is really our taking something from nature and being able to use it against nature. Right? We catch the um, uh, mountain ox or whatever it is in, in and put it under a yoke. Well, that comes from taking pieces of a tree and using them to 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 block the 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 ox's way. Right? We, we take things in nature and we recognize, we use the word properties, it's kind of a flat word, but let's use it for a minute. We, we recognize the properties of wood or of tree and we think, oh, we can take that and, and use it to do the thing we want to do, which is to hold the um, ox in place and so on. But, but, but properties is kind of, it's, it's true, it's powerful. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the right thing to think about, but that word can really not let you see similarly that issue of wonder. like. It's wonderful that trees have the experiential character they have of being hard and whatever else in the same way that it's wonderful that when you put these notes together, you know, you put these notes together, you get music. Right? Um, the, you can listen to that and once music exists, like it's easy to listen to it and you don't actually have to think about where it comes from. You just enjoy it. But if you do stop to think about it, you think, man, I don't know where that comes from. You, you might learn that if I do this and if I do this and if I do this, this, this will ensue. But that's not the same as understanding the cause or understanding where it come, comes from. And you're never going to understand that. That's just the wonder. That's the mysterious miracle of the self-occurring form of reality as is the, the property of the wood, which, which is really to say the marvelous, wonderful, self-occurring form out that is the tree. And what we learn to do is recognize that, that those am the amazing things that nature offers us and you use it against another piece of nature to bring about the results we want. So, you know, uh, a, cunning, a cunning fellow is man. His contrivances make him master, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, what are our contrivances? In any case, in every case, our contrivance is taking something from nature, which means something wonderful that occurs on its own, and being able to use it against some other part of nature. Uh, and that's why we're cunning, I guess. We kind of trick nature by using it against itself. Right? And thereby we get, we get the things we want. Um, so he brings the horse with the shaggy neck to bend under the yoke and the untamed mountain bull. And then a little bit more. And he has, and speech and wind swift thought and the tempers that go with city living he has taught himself. And how to avoid the sharp frost when lodging is cold under the open sky and pelting strokes of the rain. Uh, so that stuff there about lodging and so on, that's the same point. You, you build houses by using natural things. Similarly, we build a raft to go across the water, probably imitating or, and using naturally occurring things. The one thing that's extra there is the speech and wind swift thought uh, and the tempers that go with city living. Those are things that uh, are human and not somewhere else. And those are things uh, they say that he, he has taught himself, that man has taught itself themselves. Men have, uh, humans have taught themselves. Um, uh, that's, that's our 
miraculous self-occurring form. Speech and thought and cities we develop and the unique, the tempers, they say the unique uh, forms of living and forms of experience and forms of feeling that come in that distinctive human environment. So yeah, uh, he has a way against everything. The human human being has a way against everything and faces nothing nothing that is to come without contrivance. We, we develop our tools against everything. Only against death can he call on no means of escape. So on the one hand, he, was, he said, these contrivances make us master. And that's kind of the attitude we take towards nature. On the other hand, we can't beat death. And that kind of reminds us that we're in nature and nature nature uh, still has a say in the matter, that we are natural in a crucial way. Um, so, this, you know, we can convince ourselves by our tools and our speech and wind swift thought and the tempers that come from city living that nature is just a separate thing that we control, but everybody faces death. And that's a reminder that nature is kind of implanted in you, that you can't get away from it. And it's in a way a reminder of the wonder of nature. Um, that's enough. There's more to that course, and we should we could read more. But that what I really wanted to get out of it was that idea of wonder and 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 basically the idea of nature. Now, nature, you know, is a word you've used a million times, sh surely. But what I was hoping to do by reading that was to bring a new, richer meaning to what it is you're saying when you say nature, and then to connect that with this story we've been developing with uh, Heraclitus and Parmenides and Pythagoras. And like, you know, I've been talking about reality and the, f the form reality takes and so on. And in a way, nature is just the continuation of that story. Like, that's what we're answering to. And the harmonies that Pythagoras looked at, well, all of these things are like that. All These are all the self-occurring forms of nature, that the different elements, the seasons, the, um, uh, the animals, the plant, you know, the life forms and so on. Those and the and the properties those things have, those are all mysterious, wonderful things. Right? Um, let me go back to that one, one a little bit more about that. You know, I said that um, you can figure out eventually if you play this note, this note, and this note, it produces this miraculous musical effect. It doesn't really tell you why; it just tells you that, and you live in the wonderful experience of music that happens to be what comes about when you put certain notes together. But that's just the way reality works, right? Uh, so you can learn, it's like a recipe. You can learn the things to do to make it happen. And you can learn to appreciate that music, but it remains a marvel that there is such a thing, that reality exists like that. Uh, well, so similarly, you know, you can learn to do things with nature by taking apart the tree and getting the wood and so on. And that, that's what I was just talking about with the, making the contrivances. But I also said there briefly that, you know, it can make us feel like we're masters and we can forget the marvelous character of this. Another way of saying that is that we can falsely tell ourselves that just because we know how to take this thing apart and use it to make something else, that we understand how that stuff works. Right? We can live in denial of... The, the way in which we ha we always have a dependence on the inexplicable fact of the way reality occurs and the in inexplicable fact of nature. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways you can see that is, you know, so, so what I was saying before about the harmony is that, you know, the whole is more of the sum of its parts. And there's a very similar thing here. You can, you can do the things that result in the music happening or whatever. But you can't actually make the music. You don't. You don't bring it into being. It's the the fact that reality already works that way that allows you to do the right things that l reproduce it. But you didn't. You didn't invent it. And you can see that if you speaking of death again, you know, if you take an animal and cut it up and take all the pieces out, you can't put them back together. You have the bones and the skin. You say, okay, let's put it back together, and you put it back together. You have a corpse. You don't have a living thing, right? So you still have all the pieces. But just summing up those pieces doesn't make a living thing. So that there, I think that helps again to see what that idea of harmony is. Like the living thing is more than the sum of its parts. Like the music is more than the sum of its parts. And uh, if you imagined that that were not so, 
then you would be surrounded only by death. Right? You'd only have the parts, and you'd never be able to get those harmonies back. So let, let's look. Let's look at um, that theme of harmony now. So let's go back to Heraclitus, and I think this is the last point that I'm going to make, and then and then we'll roll on. Um, um, start with one back in, in our book it's number 12 which is fragment b123 and there he says nature fusus loves to hide so nature that very thing we're talking about it's obvious in the sense that it's 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 the only thing you're ever dealing with in the same sense that reality is obvious that's all you're ever seeing but you don't see reality as reality you don't you don't notice that dimension of it and nature in the sense i was saying is always there but you often don't notice it, and that's what I was getting at when I was saying you don't you don't count these things as miraculous. You just treat it as yeah, there's a bit of wood, or there's a tree, or I'm going to plant something in the backyard, or whatever. I'm going to have a drink of water. The the fact that you're encountering the miraculous, the wonder, the miraculous self-occurring form of nature and all that that entails doesn't even cross your mind. And it's, and if and that's why it's possible that reading the second chorus of Antigone can be um, uh, enlightening you might, you can say oh yeah and you recognize something that was always true around you but you also say you know what I wasn't noticing that right but so anyway so he says nature loves to hide and we've all just been talking about the way that nature is hidden and what it takes then to notice it um, he says again on in this book fragment 38 which is b54 Heraclitus speaking an unapparent connection actually harmony an unapparent harmony is stronger than an apparent one. Yeah, well, we, nature is those unapparent harmonies. That's really what I've been trying to bring out by talking about the music and the second chorus of Antigone. I've been really trying to give sense to the, the meaning of those two fragments from Heraclitus, that nature loves to hide, and that an unapparent harmony is stronger than an apparent one. And I think you should, could have a sense of what that means now. But So now let's go on and look at what Heraclitus says about harmony. He says, uh, number 59 in this book, which is B8, he says... What is opposed brings together. The finest harmony is composed of things at variance, and everything comes to be in accordance with strife. So he's saying that something about harmony, it also involves a notion of opposition. And then let's read a little bit more. Um, number 61 here, which is fragment B51. It's one of my favorites of all time. He says, They do not understand how being at variance with itself um actually di differing with itself is what it says they do not understand how differing with itself it agrees with itself it is a back turning harmony like the bow or the lyre uh, they do not understand how differing with itself it agrees with itself a back turning harmony like a bow or a lyre so first of all notice he starts off with that they do not understand how and we've seen that right from the start with Heraclitus that's pretty much where we began with you know eyes and ears are bad witnesses for people with barbarian souls right that that the whole thing we've been talking about is the way that we live in everyday life taking our, our reality for granted but not really noticing it and and not being struck by the 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 shocking character of it and so here he's saying so he's specifying a little bit more than what is it that we don't understand. What is the thing we should understand that we typically don't? And he says, differing with itself, it agrees with itself. A back-turning harmony, like the bow or the lyre, which resonates with that idea before, what is opposed brings together, and everything happens in accordance with strife. Uh, let me, but let me stick with this back-turning thing. So he's, he gives examples, the bow and the lyre. Well, how does a bow work? Um, if, you, if you have even a very simple bow, um, you know, it's a, it's a piece of wood, and a piece of wood, if it were lying straight, like a branch of a tree, would just be like this. But what you do is you tie string to each end so that it bends, which means you tie it with a piece of string that is shorter than the length of wood was, with the result that the string is bent, and it's tensed. And the string, too, now, because the wood is tensed, and how can I do this? I guess like this, and pu pushing to, like it trying to straighten out, it pulls the string tight. So this, the the string makes the bow tight, and the tight uh, the 
The string makes the wood tight, the frame, and the frame makes the string tight. Each of them on its own, the bow would just be lying there flat and inert. The string on its own would just be lying there in a little pile and inert. But you tie the string around the wood so that the wood is shorter, and they f basically fight against each other. The bow is trying to straighten out, but the, but the string is trying to pull back. And by, by the tying, by setting the string against the wood in a way that they can't come apart, you make a bow. And, and, and there, so that, there, there you have a new reality. And, you know, you can shoot an arrow very powerfully. If you just had a loose string, you can't do anything with an arrow. If you just have a loose piece of wood, you can't do anything with it. But you put those two things together so that they're fighting with each other. And that new entity, the bow, which is now, I would say this again, more than the sum of its parts. Right? If you think of just the part that's the wood, no, not much going on. Think of the string, not much going on. But there is a tension introduced into them that only comes by their oppositional relationship. And that tension that is induced in them by that suddenly makes a thing that is very powerful. So that's the bow, and that's, that's the back-turning harmony that, as he says, differing with itself agrees with itself so what does he mean by differing with itself he means the parts are fighting against each other but it's in their fighting against each other that the unity of the bow exists so that's the sense in which it agrees with itself it is itself in and through the the, the opposition of its constituent parts so it's a unity that only exists in and as a self-opposition and that's what he calls then a back-turning harmony Palantropos, harmoniae. Um, so we've been talking about harmonies in general, and Heraclitus is bringing out this very powerful idea that when we talk, that the, the powerful harmonies are like this. Because as he says in, in B8, what is opposed brings together. Well, that's just another way of saying differing with itself, it agrees with itself. And he says the finest harmony is composed of things that differ from themselves, right? In the way we just said. And everything comes to be in accordance with strife or tension, right? So he's saying, you know, remember he said at the beginning, uh, uh, all things come to be in accordance with the logos. And now he's telling you what that is, right? He's telling you that they come to be in accordance with, with this idea of differing with itself, it agrees with itself. I mean, he already said that when he said changing it rests. Right? But now he's he's bringing that out with the bow and the lyre. He's bringing out this idea of what a of what a back turning harmony is. So reality is a kind of back turning harmony. Uh, but it's but I guess the thing I want to say is if we look at these all these natural things that are wonders, I think Heraclitus's idea of the back turning harmony is quite insightful and informative for being able to grasp their nature. You know, I was saying the the. You can't put the dog back together after you've cut up the, the cut the heart out of it, cut the spine out of it, cut the legs out of it. You just have a bunch of pieces, and they don't go back together. But when it is alive, those things are a harmony. And it's I think that this notion of the back turning harmony kind of fits that. And if you look at the way the dog works, you know the the dog or any moving be being uh, can walk because it 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 can it can hold the center of its body as a kind of fixed axis against which it can move right and left right and that's the nature of a moving living body is that it can oppose parts of its body to itself it can oppose both sides to its center and it can oppose the sides to each other i mean and i guess the most famous example of all is the opposable thumb it's because you can oppose your thumb to your fingers that you can grasp and man can you ever do a lot with a grasping hand right? um, but if you cut those things apart and you just have a thumb sitting here and a, a, a former thumb sitting here and a former index finger sitting here there's no opposition there there's nothing but when you set them up so that they're opposed whoa you got power when you set your body up so that it can oppose itself you can move right? when you when you have a thing like this a joint which, uh, which is um, well, I guess, uh, there's another point where Heraclitus uses that word joint for back turning harmonies. But let's look at the, the joint in the arm is like similar, similarly a way you can oppose one part of your body to another, right? So just at the level of movement, like grasping, moving your arm, walking, 
the body as, as that kind of moving thing is built around that notion of self-opposition. So in that way, the, 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 the living animal body is a harmony, a back-turning harmony in that sense, and a wonder. And the evidence that it's a back-turning harmony is that when you take the pieces apart, and you, it, it's like taking the string off the bow, it's a, it doesn't work anymore. You lost everything. So the, the, the reality isn't the pieces. The reality is the harmony. And that's what it is to be a living thing. And so, so I want to suggest that we should connect then the notion of wonder that um, Sophocles introduces to interpret and think about nature. With this, with this, we should connect it with this notion of harmony that Heraclitus is introducing and, and think about that nature that way. Um, I had one more thing I wanted to say, and I have to try to remember it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I want to just read one more passage from Heraclitus uh, and then bring it back to the Sophocles and then we'll be done this one. Uh, in fi so, so I'm hoping that the basic things I've said have been clear enough and, and, and I hope they're reasonably exciting. I think they're amazingly exciting ideas. Uh, but let's go back now to number 56. 56, he says, uh, um, which is B125, he says, even the Kukaeon falls apart if it is not stirred. Um, uh the kukaeon is, is a magic drink people would make with, uh, it's in the Iliad and stuff. You put wine in it and barley and it's supposed to cure things and it's supposed to be sort of magic potion. But he says, you know, yeah, you might, you, you might think of that as a strong thing, but it falls, it settles if it is not stirred. So that tells you two things. It tells you that its strength comes from the opposition of the parts. So in that way, it's like the back turning harmony. But it's also the case that if you don't stir it, it just falls apart. So the kukan, in that sense, is not like an animal. You don't have to stir an animal, but you have to stir a kukan. So the kukan is not alive. It's, it's a piece of artifice. It's something somebody has made. It has some power, but like a, like a salad dressing where you mix oil and vinegar together, right? If, I don't know if you've, uh, well, here. Surely you know that, that you can mix oil and vinegar, or let's say oil and lemon juice together, because that tastes better, uh, and pour it on your vegetables, and you'll get a nice salad dressing. It's not the same to just pour olive oil over it and pour lemon juice over it. Uh, then, then you taste some things have olive oil on them, and some things have lemon juice, and you know, it's okay. But it's not like the salad dressing. You get quite a nice thing when you blend those. But the interesting thing about it is you have to stir it. You have to put quite a bit of energy into it to make it be this thing where the olive oil and the lemon juice are kind of held together. And they work as a salad dressing. But if you leave it for two hours, it'll settle out. The olive oil will sit on top of the lemon juice, and you won't have a salad dressing anymore. You'll have some lemon juice and some olive oil. Well, that's the same kind of thing with the cocaine. You can mix this thing up and you get a potent mixture and it, it has some real effects. Uh, so again, the mixing and the opposition is the key to, the, to, its, to its taste, its effect, whatever. But it's not a piece of nature like a dog. You have to stir it to get it together. Just like you have to tie a bow together to make it happen. There's, it's, there's no such thing as a naturally occurring bow. There's no naturally occurring posset. There is a naturally occurring dog. Right. So this, this remark about the kukaeon reminds you of the difference between those wonders that are these naturally occurring things and what in the Sophocles thing he called the contrivances. Right. The things we can make that you know allow us the, the false pretense of mastery. They allow us to think we control nature. But, but really they don't really, really they're what we're doing is depending on nature giving us powers which we could never make up uh, and it'll settle if it's not stirred right there there are things that don't they don't become alive they just they fall apart over time and they break down and they wear out because they don't they're not uh, they're not those uh, hidden harmonies right they're not those secret harmonies. they're not fuses um, so that's where I wanted to get to with the pre-Socratics. I wanted just to, to bring out from Parmenides and Heraclitus and Pythagoras and also the second chorus of Sophocles' Antigone from 442 BC. Uh, I wanted to bring out initially that, that powerful, unique philosophical orientation, which is asking about the nature of reality. And I wanted to try to bring that out as a unique and novel and original question and an important one. And then I wanted to follow out a little bit what, what you notice when you ask that question. I wanted to lead it to the notion of 
nature, but I'll say nature as fusus. I mean, that it's the same word, but I want to emphasize that word fusus to remind you to think about the sense we've been trying to get, the, I've been trying to give to fusus through these readings and, uh, and have, it, have nature start to mean that wonderful self-occurring form of reality that takes the form of back-turning harmonies uh, as exemplified in the life of the animal, for example. So let's let's pause there, and then uh, we'll come. We're going to come back. We're, we're going to now, uh, before we return to those philosophical issues about nature, we're going to pick up on the theme that just came out of this thing here about the um, uh, humankind developing the tempers that live in cities. And in fact, I think I'm going to read a little bit more of that chorus just because it will lead perfectly into what we're going to do. So, yeah. So the chorus says. Uh, He's taught himself speech and wind swift thought and the tempers that go with city living. Right? And then later, uh, then only against death has he no escape. Da, 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 da. And then the, the final little stanza. If he, he honors the laws of earth and the justice of the gods that he has confirmed by oath, high is his city. But no city has he with whom dwells dishonor prompted by recklessness. So... You know, I was just saying that those tools can make us think like we're master of nature and we can forget that that's not so. And I think something like that is the recklessness that they have in mind. So the chorus said, yeah, you're going to live in a city you're, and high is your city if you honor the laws of the earth where earth was oldest of gods, immortal and unwearied, right? This marvelous giving power that we rely on. So high is your city if you honor the laws of the earth and if you... Uh, if you honor the justice of the gods that you have confirmed by oath. Um, that, that attitude is correlated with um, the healthy and proper reality of our city life, our civilized life. But on the other hand, uh, our civilized life is a problem if it's coupled with dishonor and recklessness. So that's what I, where I want to take this now. So this this... The second chorus of Sophocles Antigone has, has basically got us now thinking, I was emphasizing so far nature, the second chorus has got us thinking about the place of the human being in nature. We're both a part of it, we die, we naturally occur and so on, but we also have this funny relationship that we, we are cunning and we can, just like we can oppose our thumb to our hands, we can sort of oppose nature to itself and make contrivances and change the whole character of the world by doing that. So we're sort of in nature and we're sort of out of nature. We're sort of of nature and we're sort of against nature. So that's uh, that's the theme I want to pursue now. I want to ask what what is the human being? What is the distinctive reality of the human being and what's its relationship to nature? We've got a little bit of the distinctive reality already. Uh, we've taught ourselves speech and wind swift, swift thought and the tempers that come with city living. So we can look at that and we can try to f further our understanding of what the human being is. And that's related then to, to city living. That was one of the things named. But it's also related to this issue of how you do it. Do you carry out your development of this distinctive human world, this distinctive human environment, in a way that is honoring and responsive to those wonders of nature that we've just been discussing? Or do we develop it in a way that's kind of reckless? I mean, I think the historical answer is pretty obvious to that, but uh, in terms of where we are now, but we can talk about that later. That's the question I want to go on now and explore with the Greeks. And so the next thing we're going to do is look at the distinctive human reality that, that occurred in ancient Greece, which is a, which is a particularly going to we're particularly going to look at then the emergence of city living. We're going to look at the uh, briefly the development of the distinctive Greek political world. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's our next unit. So we'll turn to that uh, right away.